Why, hello, advice to the player friends. So nice to be here with you this evening. I have a story for you from the Decameron. The reason might be obvious. 672 years ago, a bunch of young people fled Florence to wait out the pandemic of that time in a beautiful place on the outskirts of the city. And they spent their time dancing and flirting with each other and napping and storytelling. This is the second story of the ninth day. There was a convent in Lombardy. It was well known for the holiness and good works of the nuns who lived there. One of these inhabitants was a young woman of noble birth and notable beauty named Isabetta. One day, she went to the entrance of the convent to visit with a relative of her through the bars of the gate. And there she met a handsome young man who had come with her cousin. And she fell immediately, head over heels in love with him, the way people sometimes do in stories. And he read the language of her eyes and liked what he saw and fell no less deeply in love with her. For a long time, they consumed themselves with love separately. But then they arrived at a stratagem by which they would be able to be together. And after that, they came together on many an occasion to their mutual gratification. But one time, the young man was spotted as he was slipping out of Isabetta's cell by one of the other nuns. And she shared this tidbit with some of the others. And their first thought was to immediately denounce the lovers, to the abbess, the reverend mother, the mother superior, a woman known for her goodness and piety named Usimbalta. But on second thought, they decided to wait and arrange for the abbess to be able to catch the lovers in the act so that there could be no denial. So they bided their time and set up watches and waited to catch the lovers in flagrante. And the time came not very long afterwards when the young man was spotted slipping into Isabetta's cell. So the nun who was on watch told the others and they left her there to keep an eye on the door and they went to the cell of the Reverend Mother herself. And they pounded on the door and called out, Reverend Mother Isabetta is entertaining a man in her room. Well, it so happened that the abbess herself was not alone on this occasion. You see, she had developed the practice of every so often smuggling a priest into her cell in a chest. So when she heard the nuns at her door, she was afraid that in their zeal and haste, they would burst in upon her and her guest. So she hurriedly began to get dressed in the dark as quickly as she could. And as she was finishing up, she reached about for the headdress of pleated veils that the nuns wore in those days. And instead, her blind hand came upon the priest's breeches, and she arranged them on her head and shoulders and stepped boldly out of the room and deftly closed the door behind her and said, Well! Let's see what this harlot has to say for herself. 
And they all swept down the hallway together as one, everyone so single-minded that they didn't even spare a glance at the abbess to see what she was wearing on her head. And they got to the door of Isabetta's cell and they pushed it against it as one. And they lifted the door off the hinges and it fell with a crash. And there they discovered the lovers in each other's arms, so stunned by the sudden intrusion that they didn't move a muscle. But the other nuns picked Isabetta up and at the abbess's instruction, whisked her off to the chapter house. While the young man stayed behind, got dressed, waited to see what would happen, swearing to himself that if they so much as touched a hair on the head of his beloved, he would take revenge on as many of them as possible and then whisk her away from the convent once and for all. Now at the chapter house, the abbess sat down at the head of the room with all the nuns grouped before her and she stared down the accused and she opened her mouth and she unleashed a torrent of words calling her all manner of names, the worst names ever used to describe a woman and punctuating her tirade with threats of the direst sort. And Isabetta stood there with her eyes downcast, realizing that she had done wrong, and so dejected and shamefaced that the other nuns began to feel a little bit sorry for her. But then she stole a look up at her accuser, and she saw the leggings and ties of the priest's undergarment hanging down on both sides of the Mother Superior's face, and she immediately drew the correct conclusion. And she recovered her confidence, and she looked up and she said, by the grace of God, Reverend Mother, tend to your own headdress, and then you may say to me whatever you like. Well, the abbess had no idea what she intended by these words and was just further enraged that she had dared to say anything. And she replied, why, you impudent whore, how dare you talk back to me after what you've done, bringing the name of our convent into disrepute after we've built it up so painstakingly over so many years. But Isabetta calmly repeated, by the grace of God, Reverend Mother, Tend to your own veil, and then say to me whatever you please. And upon this repetition, the other nuns looked up at the Reverend Mother as she herself raised her hands to the sides of her face. And they all discovered at once that she had been caught guilty of the same behavior for which she was dressing down Isabetta. And she changed her tune. And she began to preach a sermon about the weakness of the flesh and how unreasonable it was to expect poor sinners such as ourselves to resist these natural urges. And then she told all the nuns gathered there that as long as they were discreet and protected the good name of the convent above all else, they were free to engage in the same behavior as often as they liked. And then Isabetta was released 
and she and the abbess returned to their respective lovers. And Isabetta continued to receive her young man on many an occasion, not paying any attention to the jealousy of some of the other nuns who, lacking similar visitors, consoled themselves in private as best they could. 